Hey guys, this video is brought to you by Dev Mountain. Dev Mountain is an in-person coding and design bootcamp that offers housing at no extra cost for immersive students. And they even have career services that can help you with job placement after you graduated. Dev Mountain loves hearing from my subscribers, so be sure to click on the link in the description tab below if you or somebody you know is ready to dive into coding and design. Hey guys, what up? All right, so I have a question and it is, what is the easiest development track? I like this question because it's really hard to answer and there's probably no correct answer and it gives me an excuse to babble about it for a little bit on YouTube, but I do have some things to say about that. So right off the bat, assuming you're not trying to be like a freelance developer, if you're gonna be like a freelance developer, you're just trying to say, I'm gonna go down to my local coffee shop, try to get a gig, help them with their website, then I'm assuming, you know, something like WordPress PHP is going to be a good option for you. But for this video, this is going to focus on more of the corporate route. Like what are the easier routes to go to in corporate development? Also, this is a nice picture from Wikipedia, but thank goodness we don't have to code like this anymore. Or even prior to like Dennis Ritchie's day when C came along and made things a lot easier. Now we have languages that are much, much easier to deal with. And we also have a crazy amount of efficiency tools when it comes to writing our code, maintaining it, doing all kinds of stuff with just billions and billions of lines of code. So I think as we've gotten better tools, we've gotten tremendous amounts of more code and data and processing power and just harder problems to solve. And it just seems like uh, looking back at this, that this might be more difficult than what we do now, but who knows, like back in the day, like this could be a little bit more chill than what we're doing now. Like, I really don't know. I've heard from some C developers from the 70s and 80s that are like, yeah, programming today in JavaScript, like with the, the crazy wild west of that, that that is, it's much more difficult than it was back in the 80s. And then again, I do also think back in the 80s, you had to have much more hardware level knowledge of, uh, of computer science. And then um, you also had to know quite a bit more math than you have to, to know now. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into it. And I think the easiest professional development route out there is going to be software testing, um, also known as like QA or quality assurance. And really it's because you're dealing with, with code and environments, configurations and such. And you have to know a decent level of computer science and how to use computers and things. But it's like you're not writing any code and anytime there's a problem, you're really just making note of it. A lot of QA testing jobs, I would say, are really boring. So a lot of people don't want to do it, uh, but they pay well. So for the job, for doing what you're doing uh, in that kind of environment compared to like, you know, shoveling concrete or uh, driving a truck or something like that, you get paid quite a bit more to sit your ass in a chair and basically look at a bunch of uh, already written applications and you're just simply following test cases. You're not going AWOL and, you know, shooting your guns in the air or whatever and just doing whatever you want. You, you want you're literally testing based on like a bunch of like specific instructions. Okay, I got to do it this specific way and I got to follow these specific instructions to set it up as such. And there's ways of like uh, automating some of that stuff, but like that's, um, that's kind of a, a separate category as well. So there's like the people and they're, they're, those are the QA people that like literally write no code. Uh, so there, there's that level, and that's probably the bottom level of QA, and they don't really know how to write code, and they don't write code. Uh, but then you have some QA people that do write code, and they deal with things like Selenium, uh, Selenium WebDriver. I have tutorials on this stuff, but it just it's automating the browser to um, at, you know mimic the user, and you can take screenshots and do more. And uh, it just for a repetitive type of testing, especially end-to-end -end testing, Selenium makes a lot of sense. And for QA developers that know a little bit of scripting and they can write some of those scripts, uh, that goes a long way with trying to land that first job. So basically QA, quality assurance, um, user testing, that, that is all considered part of the computer science field. It's part of the programming field. And a lot of times you work directly with these people as a programmer. And in many cases, they are like your typical programmer in other cases, they don't write any code, like I said, and they're just um, simply looking at the uh, the screen there. But there's a lot of opportunities in that field. There's 26,000 open jobs right now in the United States, and that's quite a bit. 
All right, so the next path I'm going to recommend for programming is going to be HTML and CSS. A lot of people will say those are markups or like some sort of semantic markup, but it's not a programming language. However, I think in most environments like HTML is considered to be programming. A lot of people consider it to be wizardry. You'd be surprised. Uh, there's times where you like work, have teams working on a backend system with tons of complicated code. You go to present it. And everybody's all concerned about like uh, a couple of lines of CSS versus like the overall architecture of the application. So uh, CSS is uh, is very important and it's looked at as uh, as such in the real world. So like if you just focused on being an HTML and CSS expert, you could kind of s avoid all of the programming logic if that is not something that is your cup of tea. Like if you really do not like functions and methods and classes and trying to deal with data types and just your, you know, your typical programming for loops and all that stuff. If that is not for you, then you still might be able to get away with a programming career as just a front end developer who writes HTML and CSS. Um, however, you would want to be an absolute expert in both of those. And I would include it with CSS in that category, probably a lot of the popular libraries that are out there and then as well as things like SAS and LESS, you know, understanding how those uh, SAS uh, or CSS preprocessors are working. Now, the third easiest option is going to be the person who does a little bit of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And when I say JavaScript, JavaScript is probably your best first language. Like if you're like, Chris, I only want you to give me one language to learn. What is the easiest one that gives me the most potential? And that's going to be JavaScript right now. So JavaScript goes from being something that is like very, very simple, it seems like, at the start, very very much like C, um, because C is uh, a, a simple language, but you have to do really complicated things to do stuff with it. So JavaScript is somewhat similar. The, the, the code itself is very easy to get started with. You can write your code in a browser. You don't even need a text editor. And uh, that sort of instant feedback is very valuable, I think, to the, to begin, to the beginner. But then from that beginning level stages, JavaScript goes up to like tremendous levels of complexity. And then you get to stuff that looks like this. This is the jQuery library, all minified. What does minified even mean? How does this code even execute? Who would ever want to debug code that looks like this? And I'll tell you that you never do, but every once in a while you have to deal with like a third party minified library and you got some sort of event exception uh, occurring deep from the depths of, of this type of shit. And trying to figure that out can be a lot of fun. From there, it gets even more complicated once you start getting into the React core library. Uh, but that said, React brought in uh, an overall like development architecture ecosystem, a way of doing things that has saved the development community a ton of time and has really emerged as a front runner. So I think, honestly, the, the complexities of React are much, much more simple than anything, obviously, using something like jQuery or what I just showed you. We use now React for a reason. That has made things a lot easier. The funny thing about that is that it's caused our salaries to go up, even though the libraries themselves make our lives uh, uh, easier. So basically, with some of these libraries, like things like React, they, they've become their own technology now where you can kind of say, okay, I'm a React developer. You don't, you don't say, like, I'm a JavaScript developer. You're like, oh, okay, I'm a React developer. I'm an Angular developer. I'm a Vue developer. And for those three client-side libraries, because there's such demand, people are getting hired in this market. That's where a lot of boot camps are focused. They're focused on those technologies. And that might be the easiest path forward. My only caution there is that you're eventually going to come up against some stuff that you've never run into and I can't imagine like going into the programming world that I, you know, going my route, having just known like a client side library and then being forced to like jump into like C sharp object oriented development or Python development or Django or like any of that stuff. I would just, and my head would probably fall off. So that said though, I do think that any one of those three technologies, if you master them, you will be able to get a job in the short term and then maybe you'll be able to learn on the job the ropes of the other programming stuff that you're kind of lacking in the meantime. And then hopefully you'll find more of a love for it too. So I don't think there's anything wrong with trying to figure out, okay, what is the easiest route to go? A lot of us have the, uh, you know, the, um, 
I was going to say Dunning Kruger, and a lot of us do have that. But yeah, a lot of us have imposter syndrome, and I think it's a normal thing when that kind of comes up, and you're like, "Well, what am I doing? What's the easiest route?" And it's probably a pretty common thing to to ask yourself. I know that I have before. Hell, I ask those questions now. Like every once in a while, I'm like, "Hey, maybe I'll do data science and learn a bunch of Scala and functional stuff. Maybe some Haskell development." No, nope. nope. Um, I'm just kind of going with what works right now. All right. So if you're asking me, um, should you learn Java or C sharp, Java and C sharp, both in the same category, I've recommended both of them. But again, this is about what is the easiest development route. Neither one of those languages or ecosystems are going to be easy for a beginner, beginner developer. It's going to be much harder than Python or JavaScript. So I would recommend that you probably don't avoid that if, uh, if you're looking for the easiest route. Also, you're probably like, well, what about machine learning? You could use PyTorch, probably the easiest way to jump into machine learning. But if you don't know math and you don't know a lot of uh, about data, you're not big on data, especially about data scraping, because you're going to need to do a lot of actual data collection and processing, then this might not be your, your cup of tea. But you could check out PyTorch, because that's going to be the easiest way to find out whether or not you're into machine learning. And that uses Python. So uh, that would be my other suggestion as well, because Python's going to teach you a lot of good coding habits. It's got a good community. And if you're looking for just an overall object-oriented, um, you know, just overall fully encompassing programming language, I think Python fits that need. That It fits the need more than JavaScript. So if you said, I don't want to do web development, definitely don't want to do web development, JavaScript's not going to be my answer, then I suppose Python would be a good option because you can do some basic game development, obviously some scripting and scraping some database work, you got Django and Flask. There's also game development, VR development, mobile app development. You really have to follow your passion, whatever your passion is going to be. Hopefully there's some passion project you have and you can start building that and you'll find some sort of deeper desire to learn code and, and you'll find your niche and maybe you'll find, you know what, I don't want to do this because maybe you don't want to be a programmer at all. There still are other types of jobs in the computer science field that deal with computer code and the more code you know, even superficial levels of knowing the code makes you much better at the job that you do. Things like systems analysts, um, like applications uh, analysts, like you have like uh, just business analysts, like if you want to do that, there's user experience design. So UX development is a very big thing. That's kind of what you know, ver Apple's always been really big on. There's database, SQL, access, all that crap. So there, there's tons of options out there for you with computer science. The more code you know, I think it's going to make you more dangerous in whatever you do, and that's in a good way. All right, guys, if you guys are interested in looking to code, make sure you guys check out my website, codehawk.com. I have a bunch of courses out there, and I'm adding new courses all the time.